insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 135. Getting Weird on the Yellow Brick Road. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my diligent and hardworking co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? Doing okay. How are you? I'm doing all right. So we took a week off last week, quite unexpectedly. (laughs) Unintentionally. (laughs) Uh, We had kind of postponed the weekday show that we were going to do to the weekend, and then the weekend came and went and... See ya. (laughs) There just wasn't... The motivation required to wasn't put a feeling well. Together. Hadn't uh, yeah. was feeling very off, very tired, headachey, and yep. just not so not how, feeling how myself. You, how do you feel now? Tired, <laughs> tired, and headachey. And- no, no headachey. Well, you know, I started working out in the morning again, so waking up early, you know, it makes for a very long very day. Long day yeah. By the time the evening comes along, I. Don't want to do much of anything, but I think my body's getting used to it now. Yeah. You know, plus, well, that's good. You know, I'm still at home, but our daughter is back in school, and I've been Indeed taking her to school and picking her up, which is nice. So she gets to sleep in a little bit and not have so to. So you're driving the bus, basically. I, I, my, my minivan is now <laughs> the, the school bus, so. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm sure she appreciates it. Oh, absolutely. A nice warm car versus a cold bus. So, there you go. Yeah. Cold infected bus, <laughs> too. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about today. Nope, not today. Today in our Disney Detective, Disney's looking to dig up some local talent in New Orleans. Plus, <laughs> Florida locals are buzzing about a sweet post-holiday deal. Yum, yum. <laughs> then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, why no one cared when Star Wars blew up a planet. And the wait for the next Star Wars game is almost over. And then in our entertainment news, Daniel Radcliffe is getting weird. And the Yellow Brick Road Tour was on, but now it's off again. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. And I think we have one afterthought to talk about in today's show. I left it in. Oh, okay. Surprise. (laughs) It's all (laughs) surprise to me. (laughs) Uh, Before we talk about all that stuff, I do want to implore our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment. And as always, video versions of this and all of our podcasts can be found listed as insights into things. We're available on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also ask you to write in, give us your feedback, give us your uh, conventions and events coming up that we can plug for you. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Or on Instagram at Instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can find links to all those on our official website and more at insights into things.com. Shall we get into it? Sure. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story is Disney will pay you to star in an upcoming Haunted Mansion movie. And look how... Wow, you almost coordinated that. Almost impressive. like I tried. So For our, view, our <laughs> listening audience, she does right. have one of her Haunted Mansion <laughs> I have one of my Haunted Mansion on. sweatshirts on. So if you are a fan of the Haunted Mansion and are looking 
uh, looking forward to the upcoming live action remake, we have some great news for you. It seems that the grim grinning ghosts are looking to cast you in the next Haunted Mansion film. Disney has been deep diving into the world of live action remakes. Uh, We've had a ton of animated classics that have now been remade into live action, like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Jungle Book, Cinderella, Lady and the Tramp, The Lion King, and more. So we've also seen that these live action takes on animated characters, also such as Cruella and Maleficent. So when it comes to park at adaptations, um, Disney has also been a little bit more hesitant. So Pirates of the Caribbean was the first ride to become a movie in 2003, starring Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow, and even finding what would become the iconic face of the franchise was tough. Robert De Niro actually had turned down the role, and Disney was not sure if it would even find a theatrical release. Later that year, Eddie Murphy's Haunted Mansion would be released, but would not find the same success as Pirates of the Caribbean. In 2021, Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt starred in Jungle Cru- in Disney's Jungle Cruise, which has already announced a sequel. Guess we should probably... Should get to watch, the watch that one, yeah. yeah yeah so then when it was discovered that disneyland's haunted mansion would have a live action movie in the works uh with the working title of joyride so we already know that the cast includes tiffany haddish uh lakeith steffield stanfield owen wilson rosario dawson and danny devito um Uh, Now the film is looking for extras and you can become one of them. So it was noted on uh, NOLA, I guess it was uh, a website, that uh, they had posted attention aspiring movie extras. A Disney feature film set to shoot in New Orleans is looking for a lot of you. The movie, which has a working title of Joyride, is apparently a reboot of the 2003 film based on Disney's Haunted Mansion attraction. The production needs hundreds of locals, males and females of all ethnicities and ages, to populate various scenes as extras in the background. Extras would be paid $161 for a 12-hour day on set. They would also receive $65 a stipend every time the production requires that they take a COVID test. Um, and it lists the casting agency, um, you know, and who you should email. It's uh, ghostsinfilm at gmail.com um, with the subject of NOLA Extra. Uh, so anybody that's actually in the area, I don't know if they're still looking for people, uh, but that would kind of kind of be cool um so the audition notice goes into uh a little more depth about the plot of the movie it says the plot reportedly revolves around a mother and a son who buy a new orleans mansion only to discover it's haunted they encounter various uh eccentric characters who are the key to unlocking a spooky mystery those characters Uh, according to a report last summer, include Harriet, a hapless psychic who is hired to speak with the spirits of the Haunted Mansion, and Ben, who was a once once an engineer working on a camera that could perceive paranormal activity, but after the death of his wife, he fell his life fell into pieces. So now he is an uh, a ghost tour guy, an unenthusiastic ghost tour guide in the French quarter of New Orleans who no longer believes in the paranormal. So kind of cool that they're, you know, looking for extras and I think it's kind of neat that they actually go into details about the plot. A little bit more about the plot than we've heard before. Right, because it's not like the extras need to know what the plot's about, right? Right, right. So it almost seems like kind of a you know, un- unintentional leak that they have. Maybe, yeah, because you figure if it's taking place in New Orleans, you figure people are going to be walking up and down the street right. and, and things like that, where the original movie was basically set only in the house, and the only people that were in the house were the ghosts, so there really weren't extras, so to, right. so to speak. Well, so, the original movie was terrible, too. Stop. It wasn't that bad. It was, it was not that good, was, either. Stop. You know, this reminds me of this reminds me of when they had to do the uh, 
quasi emergency casting for the one episode of uh, Mandalorian. Mm, and they right. wound up calling in the, the 501st. 501st to right. come in as stormtroopers as extras, which yeah. I thought was kind of like, so, th- This is kind of cool. This like, is like for those diehard Haunted Mansion people. This is that. That, that you know, live down in, in that area. Yeah. Heck, if we were closer, I, I would totally. You yeah. know, do it to try and get a, a couple days, yeah, you know, would, on that set. Would be neat, that would so. be cool. Well, maybe they'll do another one up here. A sequel up here. I, I don't know. Yeah, I doubt Or it. maybe they'll do it up in Jim Thorpe where the one uh, hotel Where the hotel, after right. That would be kind of cool. The hotel, so. That would be kind of cool. You hear that, Disney? Do, do it a little bit closer, That's please. That's right. Do some real, <laughs> you know, shooting of what inspired the, the mansion. <laughs> right, right. So what else do we have? So um, the life-size gingerbread displays are a treasured favorite each holiday season at Walt Disney World. So if you're not uh, familiar with it, um, the Grand Floridian actually has the largest of the gingerbread houses where it's, I don't even, I don't think I have what the the sizes are, but it, it's, it's huge. It actually ends up um, being created every year of fresh gingerbread. And then they actually have like a little store right, so they, they can sell, they out, of the sell out of the gingerbread house, these little things. So, you know, many guests visit year after year to experience and marvel at the beauty of these magnificent culinary creations. But have you ever wondered what happens to the gingerbread display once the holiday season is over? Well, I know you're buzzing with anticipation. And the answer is bees. Barry Stockwell, planned work specialist with event coordinate with event decorating support, explains Ten years ago, when performing our annual gingerbread display cleaning, we noticed bees were very attracted to the sugar on the display after destruction. So we decided to bring the display pieces to our Disney tree farm and lay them out in the field to give the bees a chance to collect the sugar on the wooden structures. So it's only natural we would look to nature to help us at Walt Disney World, since as a company, Disney is committed to conservation and caring for the environment. With the bee populations declining around the world, Disney has made it a mission to provide pollinators with even more habitat and resources through pollinator-friendly gardens located across the property. And for the last decade, we've surprised local bees with this sweet gift around the holidays. So now thousands of local bees visit the displays each year to enjoy the sugary treat, which helps the declining bee population by keeping them well fed during the winter months when food sources are harder to find. The recycling process begins after the holiday season has ended with the Walt Disney World event decorating support team and pastry chefs removing gingerbread from the wooden structure uh, used to build the gingerbread displays. Once the gingerbread is removed, it's recycled to use for composting, leaving a wooden structure covered with royal icing made of sugar. The team then breaks down the structure piece by piece and transports it to the Walt Disney World Resort tree farm. Then it's up to the bees to find the sugar-coated wooden pieces and collect the sugar. After the bees have left, the wood pieces are power washed with hot water and the display is stored until the next holiday season. So the story gets even sweeter. The bees that visit the gingerbread displays come from right here in central Florida. Honeybees can typically travel up to about two miles in search of nectar and pollen, and in this case, sugar. Uh, Keeping the bees well-fed helps local farmers produce honey to harvest and sell to market or even contribute to honey blends that are sold wholesale to large companies to use in delicious culinary creations, including, you guessed it, gingerbread. So keeping a lookout for these bees flying across property, collecting nectar, sugar, and pollinating the flowers around the park and resorts. You might just be responsible. They, I'm sorry, they might be responsible for some delicious ingredients found in your favorite Disney dishes and desserts. And, you know, this doesn't come as a surprise at all from Disney Mm because Disney's very into 
environmental recycling, recycling and, and stuff. Right, right. Um, and as much as I hammer on Disney, at least they they do some of these things mm -hmm. right. Yeah. What I think is interesting is when they build these gingerbread houses, they have a full structure, a wooden structure. Mm -hmm. And then they coat the wooden structure with this sweet spackle, I guess is the right. best thing it's I could the, call it. Yeah, it's the... Uh, and then they overlay the gingerbread on top of that. Right. But they take the gingerbread off. It's not the gingerbread that the bees are eating. It's that sweet spackle right. underneath they like, it. Right. They like the frosting that's right, underneath it. Right. And so... Yeah. Bees are basically like children. They just want the frosting. They don't want the cookie. <laughs> but they do use the cookie to, to compost. Right. You know, right. so and they still recycle the, the cookie too. Right. And so. I'm sure there's still probably little pieces of, of gingerbread, maybe, you know, sure. that are left. But it, it's nice that they don't just, you know, compost everything. Hey, you know, and especially Florida, you know, they're go they're almost as cold so as we now, are right now. When you go down to Florida, mm-hmm. And you go down and you go to the trash can to throw out your thing and the bees are all over the place. Just think that those bees are there for a reason. Yep. I'm not sure it's a positive reason when you're putting your hand in the bin. <laughs> you don't but... want to. Here, I'm giving you something. I'm giving you a tribute. <laughs> don't hurt me. <laughs> so that's it for our Disney detective today. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So this week in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, how a creative disagreement saved a major Star Wars planet from destruction. This one comes to us from SlashFilm.com. When Star Wars The Force Awakens arrived in December of 2015, both critics and general audiences tended to be pretty forgiving of its flaws. Sure, it rehashed the plot from A New Hope and used contrivances to bring characters like Han Solo back into the fray, but it was also an energizing, loving ode to the original trilogy that tried to make a galaxy far, far away a little more inclusive. At the same time, the movie's attempt to tap into Star Wars fans' nostalgia didn't always work, like when it tried to capture the pathos of the scene in A New Hope, in which Princess Leia is forced to watch as the Death Star destroys her home planet of Alderaan by having the First Order use its own superweapon, Starkiller Base, to blow up the New Republic's capital of Hosnian Prime and the Hosnian system. The reason this moment didn't land, well, among other things, it left a lot of Star Wars fans confused, seeing as how Coruscant has acted as the galactic capital of the Old Republic before the Galactic Empire rose to power, and continued to serve as headquarters for the New Republic after the Empire's downfall and the old Star Wars expanded universe. So what then was the point of introducing a whole new planet that Star Wars fans had no attachment to and immediately blowing it up, rather than destroying Coruscant, which would have had a real emotional gut punch? Well, according to since-deleted tweet posted on Lucasfilm, uh, by Lucasfilm executive uh, Pablo Hidalgo, the Force Awakens director J.J. Abrams had in fact intended for the First Order to destroy Coruscant in the film, but he was overruled and came up with the idea of Hosnian Prime being targeted by Starkiller Base instead. Hidalgo explains in the post, basically Abrams wanted to blow it up, Lucasfilm Limited didn't. 
Osnian Prime was the unsatisfying middle ground. There are a handful of potential explanations for why some folks at Lucasfilm made that call. For one, it's plausible that certain people at the studio were already thinking about bringing the planet back in a future project, even when The Force Awakens was in pre-production. After all, we now know that Coruscant played a central role in Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly's original script draft for the third film in the Star Wars sequel trilogy, Duel of the Fates. So it's possible a similar idea was in circulation at Lucasfilm before the pair came aboard. It's also possible that someone decided that destroying Coruscant would go over badly with the more nostalgic Star Wars fans, perhaps anticipating something like the response to Last Jedi <laughs> and its more controversial creative choices. However, you know, I would say if that was the case, then those people clearly left the company before Ryan Johnson murdered Last Jedi. Whatever the case, it seems this one example of clunky storytelling from Force Awakens, this is one example from of clunky storytelling from Force Awakens that Abrams does not deserve the blame for. And to be honest with you, it really, it left me scratching my head too, because Hosni and Prime was never even mentioned until you get to the novels and the novels, the pre, the novels that led up to F uh, Force Awakens didn't come out until after Force Awakens. So it made no sense to anybody that you just invented this planet that you arbitrarily picked as the capital of the, of the Re New Republic. So, and then the fact that you shoot one beam and it magically splits and destroys the entire system right. of planets that all seem to be clustered together is kind of questionable. And I don't know, there, there was just some really bad storytelling going on there to try and recapture that impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, they didn't do much better in the next movie, but <laughs> um, you shouldn't, certainly couldn't have done worse than I think The Last Jedi. Anyway, instead of ragging on Ryan Johnson too much, let's move on to some good Star Wars news. Uh, the new Star Wars Legos, uh, the new Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga trailer has a launch date reveal now. Lucasfilm Games uh, tells us that they've announced the highly anticipated Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, which will arrive April 5th, uh, 2022. Uh, welcome news made even better by the debut of an extensive new trailer featuring the biggest look yet at gameplay, worlds, and the humor of Lego Star Wars. And really, who doesn't love a dancing bantha? Uh, coming to most major platforms, this latest extension of Lego Star Wars allows fans to play through all nine episodes of the core saga travel through hyperspace, and explore over 20 unlockable planets. It also offers an exciting mix of gameplay, from chaining attacks and lightsaber combat to space battles. Players can also unlock and choose from over 300 characters, the most ever in a LEGO Star Wars game. Some of the key changes to the great green game franchise include the ability to explore the saga in any order. Players can dive into the Skywalker saga and access any of the nine saga films right away in any order they choose, and they can direct where to go and how to play, which sounds exceedingly confusing to me, but should be interesting. <laughs> this way you can skip Last Jedi if you right, want to. Right, you can skip all the bad ones. <laughs> you can also play as iconic heroes and villains. There are hundreds mm. of playable characters from throughout the galaxy and every era of the saga. Players can play as Luke Skywalker, Rey, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Finn, BB-8, and a legion of other heroes. Or they can turn to the dark side as Darth Vader, Emperor Palpatine, Kylo Ren, and more. Hmm, I wonder who you'll be playing as. Um, I'll be wearing BB-8. Decidedly <laughs> darker clothes than most in game. Uh, you also get the laugh out loud Lego humor for all the unforgettable moments from the entire saga. 
They're being retold in new, fun-filled, hilarious Lego humor. You also get to discover legendary locales. Players can visit familiar places from their favorite Star Wars films, such as the Desert of Geonosis, the Swamps of Dagobah, and the Snowfields of Starkiller Base. They can then travel through space and revisit any planet at any time. There's expansive hub areas based on memorable settings from the films, which offer fun quests and more to explore. And the biggest thing that they're really touting about the new game is the powerful player experiences. Players can play on the light side or the dark side, master combat, and take control of ships and vehicles for empowering adventures throughout the galaxy. So I threw this one in here because it was, it's been delayed seemingly forever yeah. now. Yeah. We've talked about the delays a couple times, and mm -hmm. a lot of people have been excited about this. I used to play this with Sam. Mm -hmm. I, I've played them with uh, Madison. They're fun. They're carefree. It's it's a great way for parents, really, to interact with their kids in a, in a video game. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a fun theme that I think we all enjoy. Absolutely. I, th I think Maddie, you know, even though she's older, she would still enjoy playing this because, you know, because the other thing too is she's still into Legos. She's, right. you know, very much a Lego that's the engineer. engineering brain of Right. Hers. She likes to build things and, you know, and that's part of playing because you have to get pieces to right. make stuff and, you know. Plus, it's cute. Yeah, they do so, a really good you know. job of introducing the collectability, mm -hmm. the yeah. adventure, the story. And, you know, they kind of blend it all together. They've always done a very good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it'll come out in April. And I'm sure we'll be yep. getting it and playing it extensively. I have no doubt. <laughs> so that's all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So of all the musicians in all of history, few are so genuinely deserving of a biopic treatment as Weird Al Yankovic, the frizzy-haired, Hawaiian shirt-adoring dude who's made a prolific career for himself pumping out delectable song parodies from Eat It to White and Nerdy. Well, we're all now in luck. So that... Fabulous channel, <laughs> Roku. <laughs> it still makes me laugh. Oh, and you can't get it on Apple TV. I already looked, by the way. Awesome. Uh, Roku announced last week that uh, an all-new feature film about the Grammy Award-winning polka songsmith, aptly titled Weird, the Al Yankovic story, is going to be made available exclusively on the Roku channel. It's described by the platform as holding nothing back in exploring every facet of Yankovic's life from his uh, meteoric rise to fame with early hits like Eat It and Like a Surgeon to his torrid celebrity love affairs <laughs> and famously depraved lifestyle, which is <laughs> so not the case. Um, they're certainly not one for hyperboles. 
And it gets even weirder. When you think of casting for Al in his aforementioned frizzy hair and Hawaiian shirts, goofiness and his general air of uh, belligerence, Daniel, Ra- I totally messed up that up anyway, but Daniel Radcliffe probably wouldn't be the first person that comes to mind. But that's what it is. Radcliffe, the Harry Potter star, will be playing Al in the movie. Um, Al said, when my last film, uh, UHF, came out in 1989, I made a solemn vow to my fans that I would release a major motion picture every 33 years, like clockwork. And I'm very happy to say that we're on schedule. And I'm absolutely thrilled that Daniel Radcliffe will be portraying me in the film. I have no doubt whatsoever that this is the role future generations will remember him for. (laughs) And then (laughs) if there's any justice in the world. Uh, When Weird Al first sat down against my will and told me his life story, I didn't believe any of it. But I knew that we had to make it into a movie, said writer and director uh, Eric Abel. Um, in a very earnest tone, uh, where clearly, clearly aren't enough biopic movies about famous musicians, and we were excited to shine a light on this incredibly true, unexaggerated story of Weird Al. Uh, this is sincerely the ultimate combination of talent, talent, creativity, and friends coming together to make something genuinely funny and we could not be prouder to call this film a Roku original, he continued. Um, the Weird Al story is written by uh, Yankovic and Appel, and along with his directing duties, Appel will serve as the executive producer. The film is being produced by Funnier Die and Tango, um, and Yankovic also serves as producer. The release date... Uh, has not been announced, but shooting actually begins next month. So I have to, I have to say that I'm very glad to see that they're coming out with this movie because it, it uh, lessens the guilt I feel over not buying the tickets to the Al Yankovic show that's coming to our area. Yes. So I feel a little less bad about that, but because we're hopefully going to get a movie within. A year or so. Right. So we'll have to sit upstairs in a bedroom with a Roku TV and watch it because that's the only TV we'll be able <laughs> to watch That's the only TV on. we have it on. But yeah. So this, I mean, just the way they're hyping this up now, you know, it's oh, going to be it's, hilarious. It, it, it has to be, you know, and, and, you know, every couple of days, Weird Al is, you know, tweeting about something about it. Um, you know, he was excited about it. So it wasn't like it was just a story that nobody picked up. All these, you know, and it's, different it's celebrities funny. are talking about it, and it's they're like, "Oh my god, why did it take so long?" It's almost appropriate that it's on the most obscure <laughs> streaming channel on the internet, right? Right. Now, right. You know, if we still had, you know, public access television, right. that's where you know it w- it would be put on. And what was funny because they they. A couple of different articles talked about the original spoof uh, that Funny or Die did, which I'm sure you can, you know, do a Google search and and find it for the unauthorized, you know, Weird Al uh, story. And, and it, you know, talks about, you know, how he was dating Madonna for a while. And and it was all this. And and it was funny because when we went to his last concert, they showed you know, most of that too. So for fans that hadn't seen it before, that was their first look into it or for, you know, the younger fans. So that's a really funny one. You know, it's probably like a 10 minute, uh, you know, uh, a video clip to, right. to just watch and see where this might actually be a little bit more serious, but still kind of along the, you know, how can you take me seriously? Sure. Cause this is what I do. Yeah, type we're thing. Definitely looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. We're, all, we're all weird uh, fans in this house. Yes, we are. So our next story, I got to set this one up because <laughs> our next story, we like we said, we had skipped doing a show last week. The first part of this story was done for last week. And in that short period of time, it changed so much that the entire scenario has now flipped. So tell us about this one. Yeah. So 
Elton John had revived his farewell yellow brick road tour uh, after it had hit pause for um, for uh, the pandemic starting. And now they've had to postpone it because he's now tested positive for COVID. So Elton John, who turned 75 in March, canceled his goodbye shows Tuesday and Wednesday at Dallas's American Airlines Center and will reschedule those dates. The shows were originally scheduled for June of 2020, but postponed during the first wave of the pandemic. In a statement to USA Today, John's representatives said that the singer, who is fully vaccinated and boosted, is experiencing only mild symptoms. Uh, he's expected to resume the tour on Saturday in Little Rock, Arkansas. John's swan song launched in September of 2018 with a planned 300 shows on the docket. The tour chugged along up until March of 2020 when COVID-19 forced a nearly two-year break. John returned to touring January 19th with a performance in New Orleans. The Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour has a slate of scheduled dates, including Chicago, New York, and Detroit, before wrapping this leg in April, uh, uh, April 28th in Miami. Then John heads overseas uh, before returning to North America for a run of stadiums starting in July in Philadelphia. His prolonged goodbye tour is now scheduled to end summer of 2023. <laughs> so much for wrapping it up anytime soon. So during the sidelining of his live performances, John hardly remained idle. In October, he released The Lockdown Sessions, a collection of duets with artists all recorded either via Zoom or under strict health and safety regulations. The effort spawned the song Cold Heart, which marries Rocket Man and Sacrifice with a, sh with a fresh vibe. The hit returned John to the Billboard Top 100 for the first time in 21 years and cemented his well-known appreciation of contemporary artists. So, yeah, it's it's good to hear that he's only experiencing mild symptoms mm -hmm. yeah. uh, right now. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I got to give credit. I mean, he planned a exceedingly long farewell tour mm -hmm. uh, for someone his age and uh, – He's sticking with it. Yeah. You know, we just had the news that Adele had to cancel her residency. Right. Or postpone her residency in Vegas because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really tough time to be doing these types of right, things. Right. And, it, and that's where, I guess, you know, where we are, where we had, you know, talking about Weird Al, we had the opportunity to buy tickets. The concert isn't coming to our area until October and you know part of it was oh, well we can't really get good seats but do we really by October do we want to be sitting right. with people well, and, it's, and uh, it's like that, we had an opportunity to get tickets to see Eagles and I love the Eagles I'd right. love to go see them again we've seen them three times now four mm -hmm, times I think so. but that but That's the again, Eagles concert the Eagles was a couple of weeks from was now. yeah it was in two months and it's like i'm <sighs> not ready to go back into an arena that soon right and that's the other thing too is it would be an indoor arena it's not even like oh well it's outside and we can walk around the concourse and you know maybe nobody will be sitting next to us ha 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 right. uh, yeah so it's yeah, if I'm going to pay what it costs to go to an well, Eagles concert, I don't want to risk my life doing it, too. To, it was going to be a mortgage payment. So, um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, uh, we wish him well. We hope mm -hmm. he, gets, he gets better quickly. Um, I, I probably would hold off on that farewell tour until things calm down quite a bit. I mean, I know he wants to get it over with and retire, but you might just have to retire, dude. Like. Mm. Yeah, it, it might that, be the that best would be thing. a shame if you know but, he you wasn't know, able. You got to do, do it, what's but... right for you and your family. Absolutely, you know, he, he, and that's the idea. His idea is he wants to retire and to spend more time spend with his time kids with his, and, his family. Yeah. yeah, so it's like that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. That's the driver here, and yeah, you know, you can't put your health at risk in the process of doing yeah, that. So that is true. We'd all love to see him. I'd love to see him again. We saw him in concert a few years back when mm -hmm. uh, he and Billy Joel were touring together. Mm -hmm. 
puts on a fantastic show. I'd love to see him again, but you got to do what's right for, for you and your, your family. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, but that was it for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a few seconds with our insightful picks of the week. <laughs> your insightful pick. <laughs> so my insightful pick is a movie that came out in theaters uh, at the end of the year, but also was released on Amazon Prime, and it is Being the Ricardos. So the movie takes place during one week of production of the I Love Lucy show. From Monday's table read through Friday's audience taping, Lucille Ball, who is played by Nicole Kimman, and Des uh, Desi Arnett... N Blah, 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 blah. Desi Arnaz, who is <laughs> played by Javier Bardem, face a series of personal and professional crises that threaten their show, their careers, and their marriage in writer-director Aaron Sorkin's behind-the-scenes drama. So, largely departing from its source material's lighthearted tone, being the Ricardos defined definitely wasn't short on real life drama. The film was told of a whirlwind week for Desi and uh, Lucy, and in the midst of this dramatic red scare, Lucy has found out that she is now pregnant with her second child, which kind of puts the whole show's production in a tailspin. And then there's a story about Ricky that comes out that he might be cheating on his marriage. So although director Aaron Sorkin played fast and loose with the real life timeline, most of the events in the film were true. It just didn't happen that accurately or within that one week. Uh, one of the largest not so secret secrets about I Love Lucy was the backstage bickering specifically between Vivian Vance and William Frawley, who played uh, Ethel and Fred. But while being the Ricardos incorporated some animosity between the two, all in all, it downplayed their feud. So this was a very interesting, again, it was a biopic. So, uh, you know, again, the different aspects of it were, were true. All these different things had kind of happened, but not in the timeline that they showed. It didn't just all happen in, in one week. Um, they kind of do it almost like a little bit of a documentary where they have some of the original writers who have all passed away, none of them are, are alive, saying, oh, this is what happened that week. You know, kind of uh, introducing how, how it goes on, and then you kind of, Like a you know, docudrama. Almost. Yeah, kind of like a docudrama. Um and then they do some some flashbacks. You know, you can kind of see where, you know, Lucille Ball, you know, she where, you know, she was a, a B actress. She was a contract player for so many years and she finally gets let go. And it's like, well, now what am I going to do? And and, you know, where she meets Desi and, and how that whole relationship started and, and things like that. And then that, you know, Desi didn't get as much of. Uh, the uh, accolades for you know what he brought to the table with producing the show and and doing all these ideas and and things with the cameras and you know things that they do nowadays with sitcoms were all started by him it was all his idea so it was very interesting to see that and then again the relationship between Vivian and um Lucille because you know, Vivian, you know, wanted to be kind of the sexier friend, but they needed her to be frumpy. So they got mad at her when she was losing weight. And then the, the other thing, too, and I never it never really dawned on me. There was like a 20 years, a 20 year age difference between Vivian Vance and William Frawley. And he's the husband and wife. So like it never dawned on me that there was such an age difference and that was a big animosity, you know, so a lot of the bickering that you saw on the show 
went on in, you know, the daily routine and, and whatnot. And at the end of the film, they do have a little blurb about, you know, how long the show lasted and that, you know, right after the show lasted, that's when they filed for divorce and, you know, whatnot. So they gave you the realistic, you know, background. But it was it was very well done. If you're a fan of, you know, uh, I Love Lucy or to get a, a sneak peek of it. Now, I think there's actually another I Love Lucy uh, documentary that that's coming out um, as well. So, you know, seems to be a hot topic, you know, right now. So mm-hmm. very, very good. If you're if you're, uh, you know, interested in little biopics like that. Good thing. Thank you. So at the risk of beating a dead horse here, I'm going to talk once again about <laughs> the expanse this time. Your favorite specifically show. Specifically. The season six finale. And I think I might be going to the well one too many times with the expanse again, but it'll surely be the last chance for a while to do so. So the books in the show are so good. I can't recommend it enough. Obviously, uh, with us digesting the sixth and final episode of season six, I think it deserves a little extra attention. Holden and the crew of the Rosinanti fight alongside the combined fleet of Earth, Mar, and Mars to protect the inner planets from Marco Anaros and his free navy's campaign of death and destruction. Meanwhile, on a distant planet beyond the rings, a new power rises. In the thrilling season finale, which I love how they term it as a season finale, not a series finale, so I'm curious mm. if the wording, if the wordplay is right. interesting or significant. Inners and Belters fight side by side with the crew of the Rosinanti in a last massive desperate battle with Marco and his free navy with the fate of the solar system, the ring gates, and all of humanity hanging in the balance. So without giving away too much in the way of spoilers, here's my thoughts on the finale. As with so much of the rest of the series, it was remarkably loyal to the books and its content. Reading things in the books... We always try to imagine how it would look on screen, and I, you know, think they can't possibly pull something like that off without a major motion picture budget. Then I watch the show, and I'm impressed every time they pull it off, and they exceed my expectations. There was just enough foreshadowing to leave the uninitiated guessing as to what comes next if you haven't read the books. So they put enough teasers in there to, to kind of whet your appetite. The conclusion itself is tastefully done, bringing the entire six seasons full circle with a cast of characters being exactly who we knew they were and a final act of following one's conscience conscience, similar to what started everything back in Season 1, Episode 1. Our heroes dramatically drift off into the sunset with the promise of a new day and the looming shadow of yet another threat to the galaxy waiting in the wings. I can't wait to see how the next season or series or movie or whatever it's going to be turns out. There's just enough deviation from the books to make the shows fresh and interesting and leaving me guessing, which I like. But they also close enough plot points to the books to be like wrapping yourself in a comfortable blanket while you enjoy watching your crew, the crew you've come to love doing their thing. I love the finality, the finale, but I'm already jonesing for more. So hopefully we won't miss uh, the expanse for too long. There's rumors that it's going to be coming back in another series that a sequel series that they termed it as, and possibly a movie. They're referring to season the episode six as the season finale, not the series finale. So that gives me some hope. Uh, there's a ton of story left out there. They got three novels left to delve into the story. Mm-hmm. They've already set the plot points for the next novel, and I'm interested to see where they go with it. And the other thing too that we haven't figured out how to do yet or, or look for is that they're supposed to be these the little web segments, the little web segments yep. that are intertwined if you look on uh, a device. You can't do it if you're watching it on Apple TV. Or, right, they have to do it on a tablet. You have to do it on like a tablet. That. So that would be interesting to kind of go back through to, to yeah, catch those little things. It only amounts to about a half hour's worth of material, okay. but it's definitely worth watching. Yeah. There's, I think there's 
four or five of them. Yeah, that, so that's something we need to to kind of dig through and, and absolutely. find. Absolutely. So. so we'll we'll definitely be doing that to tide us over until we get some more of yep. the expands. Uh, so that was my pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be Good right one. back with our answer thoughts. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So we have one afterthought today. What I is see that, that one? It is Zolocon. <laughs> I didn't want to th- steal your thunder. <laughs> uh, that is the first weekend in March. It is Saturday, March 5th and Sunday, March 6th. Uh, children 12 and under are, uh, I'm sorry, four, four to 12 are free. Um, anything or I'm sorry, t- what? Children, oh, it was weird the way it's so or 12 or five, right? Or five dollars with it, adults, and then 10 and under are free. And that's so Saturday. Oh, on Saturday, gotcha. <laughs> I you wrote this, did I? So, anyway, children 10 and under are free on Sunday, but on Saturday, it seems so. If you're taking $5. kids, go Sunday, go it's Sunday, free. it's free. Uh, I know Sunday they do a costume contest, um, they have. You know, a bunch of local artists show up there, obviously a bunch of different vendors uh, selling new toys, old toys. So even if you're not into toys, go to Zolocon just so you can get into the Fuge and see it. It's the coolest venue I've ever been to. Yes, if you are any way, shape, or form into space stuff, NASA, you know, anything anything to do with that, uh, sci-fi even, uh, it's such a cool place. Unfortunately, some of the area, uh, they don't have as much uh, to look at as they used to. They got rid of some of the displays and stuff, but just the main room, you're sitting there and there's the the centrifuge right there. (laughs) The world's largest centrifuge. It's so powerful they actually had to specially locate it here so because the bedrock is so close to the surface of the the ground they a- had to anchor it in the bedrock and anytime they spun it up they had to notify the local power company because they had to put extra power on the grid to handle it i believe it but it's cool because you know one of the areas where you go upstairs it's the little control room right. and all the stuff you know is still there and you kind of walk and then here's a banquet room <laughs> right <laughs> like, right it's just a very cool uh you know feel to it uh you know and it's one that we look forward to uh unfortunately when they had it last year you weren't feeling that great right. um so maddie and i went and met up with some friends and and went to it so it's i don't it's, care you're wheeling me out there in a wheelchair this time <laughs> i'm going I'm not missing it this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very cool, and and you find just strange and unique things, and you know uh, they a lot of vendors, great selection mm-hmm. of vendors there. Yeah, yeah, artists, everything. Mm-hmm. It's it's really it's one of the best ones in the area. Yeah, you know? yeah. So anyway, uh, that's March fifth and sixth uh, in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Thank you. No problem. Um, and that's it for the show. But before we do go, I would want to once again invite you to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions listed as insights in entertainment, video versions listed as insights into things. We're on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I would also invite you to check us out elsewhere. You can give us feedback at comments at insightsintothings.com. Find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find us streaming five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. You can find YouTube videos, all of our shows on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. You can also find uh, audio versions of us on the web at podcast at insights into entertainment.com. Uh, did you say videos? You can get that last one. Oh, okay. The, the website ones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or you can go to our official website for links to everything and anything about us. And that is insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.